So uh, I usually talk about design for impact and taking stuff to scale and all this stuff, and I can talk about this stuff in my sleep. But uh, I'm kind of going off the reservation here. We're going to talk about happiness and how you can, how thinking about happiness might change the way you design um, interventions to try to have impact. And so uh, it's new. This is new to me as well, and I'm not an expert in happiness. Uh, so this, you're you're at a jazz show here. You're not at the symphony. And um, but this got this got started for me when, remember back when Bhutan started talking about gross national happiness, and I didn't know what that meant and what what does that mean for your average Bhutanese, and. Um, I started thinking about Mulago, and uh, <clears throat> like, what are we doing all this stuff for? What are we doing our health and education, livelihoods, conservation? What's it, what's it for if not happiness? And how does thinking about happiness as this meta mission uh, change what you do? Because if we're not creating happiness, why are, why are we bothering with this stuff? And then you start thinking about it, though, and there is this relationship between happiness and impact. Impact tends to make people happier. If they're happier, they tend to participate in the activities more enthusiastically that create impact. So you get in this lovely positive feedback loop between your effectiveness and your happiness. So I sit up on my roof in San Francisco and I read this stuff because I got really curious about how we can take happiness and help it shape our portfolio and what we do at Milago. So the things that have been really useful to read are evolutionary psychology, social psychology, plain vanilla psychology, behavioral economics, some kind of game theory for dummies. Uh, and then there's this whole happiness literature that's emerged kind of its own thing. And that stuff's really interesting. And there are these annual surveys all over the world that ask people how satisfied they are with their life and, and essentially how their day go. And that's, that stuff is flawed and it's utterly fascinating. And so we're going to go a little tour, but before we do, the thing that helps you understand happiness more than anything else is to realize that 99% of our evolutionary history was spent in small bands of 12 to 24 people on the African savanna, where we were really dependent on each other. The way we related was through sort of reciprocal altruism, the way that all higher mammals relate, which is a relationship where I do things for you, expecting things to you to do things for me, and we maintain that relationship over time. So long-term relationships where people needed to help each other survive and do things for each other. And it's, it's always interesting to me, if you think about it that way, almost everything we do makes sense. Especially since in a small group, your status really makes a big difference. And humans care more about status than almost anything else. So as almost a warm up, let's take a run through the, the world data on happiness. It's kind of a way of stretching and warming up for thinking more deeply about happiness. So it's kind of a whirlwind tour. You can't always make generalizations about it, but it gives you a lot of insights about what's happening in the world and how you might think about happiness. So there's two ways that people think, ask about happiness. The first is affect, emotion. What is people's ex emotional experience of happiness? And the standard way that they come to do this is they ask people about yesterday five questions. Did you enjoy yourself yesterday? Did you laugh or smile a lot? Did you feel respected? Were you rested? And did you do something or learn something interesting? Which is a really, that's a fascinating set of questions. It kind of nails it, like that's a good day. So when you look at the, did you have a great day yesterday survey, what you get is this. Number one, Paraguay. <coughs> Number two, Panama. Number three, Guatemala. Number four, Nicaragua. Nicaragua is, after Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Ecuador, Costa Rica, Colombia, 
Denmark. Honduras, <laughs> El Salvador. So obviously move to Latin America. There is though, when you, when, you, when, you, when you read psychologists talking about Latin America, there is a culture of positivity there. And I just had dinner last night with a guy from Peru and he said, yeah, my, I call my relatives on the phone, they say, everything's great. And then I find out from the other cousin that they're in mid-divorce, they're going bankrupt. There is just, culture plays a big role in interpreting the world. And so you look at who had a lousy day yesterday. Syria. This is 2013 data, lowest score on this ever. 36% of people had a decent day yesterday. The rest of them, it sucked. Lowest score ever. Chad, Lithuania, Bosnia, Serbia, Nepal, Yemen. These guys all have lousy days. Lebanon and Tunisia. So if you look at that, you notice, first of all, don't go to a former Soviet country to live. The second is they've all had recent conflict. Or the other ones, they're either economically stagnant or they've had recent conflict. Now, that's affect, and it's just so much more uh, labile that the question that people take a lot more seriously is life satisfaction. Are you satisfied with your life? And the standard is this Cantrell scale of one to 10. They call it the happiness ladder. So they ask that Gallup asks that all over the world in uh, 180 countries every year. And they've been doing it for a long time. And so you can get a really good idea of what's happening. I'm using 2009 data. This, there's, there's a world happiness report that the Earth Institute just put out for 2013, and it's fascinating reading. reading. But I'll, I'll explain in a minute why I chose 2009. But here's our happiness top 10 in the are you satisfied with your life question from 2009. Costa Rica, Denmark, usual suspects, and then Mexico and then Canada, Sweden, Panama. Those were the countries most satisfied with their lives in 2009. The bottom 10. Togo, Zimbabwe, Benin, Sierra Leone, Madagascar, Mozambique, Haiti, Ethiopia, Liberia, and Afghanistan. You can all, I'm sure you're thinking about what you know about those countries and what that tells us about the trends. Notice Togo. Togo is always there. So then this guy, Vinoven, in, in the Netherlands has come up with this idea, the happy life years. And the only place I could find that calculated was in 2009, which is why I've used 2009 data. But, so this is the analog of, you've all heard of disability adjusted life years. This is happiness adjusted life years. So where are people spending the most of their life happy? So this looks just like the happiness list, except Ireland popped up because those guys live so long. And the <coughs> bottom unhappiness life here is these are all places, for the most part, where life is short. It's not very happy, and it's short. And they're the HIV countries, by and large. So I got interested, and if you take that out, so it, it, it skews it that, that you know, it's a, all over, Sub-Saharan Africa, you've got average life expectancy of like 40. So if we remove that and say of the countries where people are living longer than 55 years, who's on that list and what does that tell us? And suddenly the whole character of the list changes. And you've got all these, again, countries in conflict or former Soviet countries that are economically stagnant. So then I invented a, a new category which is taking the happiness life years and looking at what percentage of people's expected lifespan they're happy. Costa Rica, at the top of the list. They're, the most, they're spending the most time stoked of anybody in the world. And again, suddenly somebody from Latin America bubbles back up. Now this is the least stoked. So if we go back to the most stoked, the, the number for Costa Rica is 86% of the time. 
86% of your life, pretty darn good. Togo, 26% of your life, pretty good. So these are the countries where people are, are spending way too much time unhappy. And then I thought, well, what if we calculated the places where people are spending the most time unstoked? Spending, this is where, where's the global burden of long-term unhappiness? And suddenly, there's Togo again. And then you get these countries, Bulgaria, Macedonia, each of which kind of has its own story that might explain. But they're places where people live longer and less happy. They're mostly, either there's conflict or they're economically stagnant. So, what's the deal with Costa Rica? It's just a beautiful. It's beautiful. Perfect. Let me, let me set some more and anybody can tell me any more you can think of. Okay, same life expectancy. What's that? Good. What else? Universal peace for a long time in the midst of a conflicted place. Education, democracy. Great music. Great music, not a small thing. 50-year environmental plan. Huh? Thank you. Forests that are growing. Best environmental record of almost any country on earth. Community. Strong community, and that is what a lot of people say is a big part of that Latin American contingent as a whole. What's that? Yeah, we, we said that, and it should be emphasized. So, uh, what's that? You know, in the Gini coefficient, they're at about 50. They're just right in the middle. So, and interestingly, the Gini coefficient does not really track with happiness. It tracks in an individual country's happiness. Like, there's a great study showing that as the Gini coefficient changes in the US, happiness has changed. So in a given country, it might matter. And in the wealthier countries, Gini coefficient matters. In the poor countries, it's just scattershot. It's all over the place. So I just wrote my little list here. It sounds just like you guys. This one, though, I think is a big deal. They're way better off than their neighbors, and they know it. And it's a source of national pride. They have a culture that you ask a Costa Rican, how's your day? They go, pura vida, life is good. They have really low corruption scores. They're, they're, they're um, the lowest in Latin America. And corruption. If you look at that, uh, that Earth Island Institute World Happiness uh, Survey, corruption is a big component of national happiness worldwide because it makes people feel like they're stuck. They have very in inclusive institutions. So I don't know how many of you might have read um, Why Nations Fail, and they, they talk about how countries that are going to do well have inclusive institution with high high citizen participation that are looking to provide services for those people and involve them. Countries that are going to fail have extractive institutions where the elites have captured the, the mechanisms of power and ex extracting rents. Inclusive institutions. Steady growth, not spectacular any one year, but steady 5%. Only dipped in like 2009, below 1%, and then went back up. Very tolerant culture. Gay rights, uh, tolerant of, of uh, ethnicity. That tracks really well worldwide with happiness. And of course, good surf. <laughs> OK. What's going on here? Why Togo again and again and again? So I like Google, why Togo so unhappy? And a bunch of stuff comes up. And one is, it's the typical problem in Africa. A father ruled for a long time, groomed his son. His son is now doing that typical, I've had two terms. The third is unconstitutional. I'm going to change the Constitution. Singapore. That, huh? Singapore, Singapore I didn't do. What, would, what interesting thing I read about Singapore. Singapore's not all that happy, by the way, just for the record. They're pretty, pretty low on this record. You can hold forth on Singapore when we're done, though. Hold that thought. Um, they have terrible infrastructure. Everything's a hassle there. They, you know, this is a long strip of a country about 
about six times as long as it is wide, and there's not a decent road going that distance. This I heard again and again, a, an exact opposite of the Pura Vida culture of Costa Rica, people like to kvetch in Togo. It's, <laughs> do I want to hear that? <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, in a narrow country, nobody's that far from Ghana, and Ghana is doing way better. So there's nobody in Togo who doesn't know that Ghana is doing way better. The government controls all the professionals. In other words, you're a doctor, you go where they tell you. There's not a lot of freedom of choice for the elite class of, of service professionals in Togo. Most of the commodity crop industries are nationalized and are dominated by government state entities and they chronically perform badly and pay late and people complain about that endlessly. One of the worst corruption records in the region and lousy surf. <laughs> so that's why. That gives us a sense of, of why they're stuck. So now we've looked at the, now we've kind of gotten a tour of the world, got in a sense of some trends from there. So what is that? And then the literature relevant to happiness suggest about how we can look at what we do and optimally design to maximize happiness. So the first thing is that we have to meet people's basic needs. Because when their basic needs aren't met, they're anxious. And one thing to take from today is anxiety is the enemy of happiness. It's there are two states that are incompatible. I mean, think of when you're anxious. Think of when you're late, for example. Um, I catch myself being nastiest when I'm late. I get anxious when I'm late, um, especially if I care about where I'm going. But anxiety and happiness are incompatible. You're anxious unless your basic needs are met. Safety, water, food, shelter, energy increasingly everywhere income you're anxious if your basic needs aren't met so that tells us what our priorities are in terms of missions we have to meet those basic needs now here's an example of an organization that i think is, is meeting basic needs in a really important interesting way so people are talking more and more in this this um Earth Institute World Report on Happiness talked about this a lot. We have to think about mental illness and mental health as a basic need. So it turns out that depression is the number one cause of debility, disability worldwide. And it's quite treatable. So Mulago has long been looking for a really good, scalable mental health uh, intervention. And we came upon this organization, Strong Minds, a new organization. And what they do is they take a proven low-cost model for depression group therapy and are trying to blow it up. And this model was developed in the Congo to treat rape victims. It showed remarkable results. And it's a group therapy model where a trained layperson comes and runs weekly sessions with a group of women for 16 weeks. The results in the Congo were really strong, and then nobody did anything with it. Although some people went back and they found that these groups that started, they, they, a lot of them were still meeting three years later. So Sean Mayberry, who used to work for Vision Spring, thought, here's a huge opportunity, not to reinvent, but to take something proven and go big with it. And when you think about meeting basic needs, this is spectacular because it turns out that the child mortality in depressed mothers is double that of healthy mothers. And only half the number of girls are in school and the family income's lower. So you treat depression, you start getting all these knock-on effects. So Sean, they just finished their first 16-week uh, trial and compared their controls their, their treatment group 
showed a 93% remission of major depression symptoms. So they're in remission from this disease now, compared to 30% in the control group. So they got a 60 percentage point effect. So this is a basic need with a scalable solution. And this is the kind of thing that we're looking for. And so the other thing, though, when you're thinking about setting out to meet basic needs, and by the way, increasingly money is a basic need. It's a cash world. You're going to be second class, third class citizen unless you can improve your income. And the old, you know, does money buy happiness? Yes, absolutely money buys happiness. And I just picked some curve out of a whole bunch of them. They all look the same. The happiness versus GDP per capita all look like this everywhere. If you do a log GDP, it turns out to be a straight line. In other words, your happiness starts to flatten out as the, in as the income increases. Notice it doesn't go flat, though. And in the US, it flattens out at about $75,000, which is to say you're keeping up with the Joneses pretty well. Um, but as you get richer and richer, even in the US, it continues to increase. The other interesting thing is the dotted line is what happens when you plot happiness life years against GDP per capita. And that's more of a continually straight line because life expectancy increases in the same in the same curve as GDP per capita. And the, but then notice, if you want income to make a huge effect on people's happiness, work with the poor, because any given amount of income at that end of the curve has a huge disproportionate income, impact. And I make the case you know, just that much more strongly for impact. If, if you've run into a book called Scarcity by uh, Melanathan and uh, oh, one of those other Poverty Action Lab Mafia authors, um, they talk about something really interesting called the bandwidth tax. The notion that we all have only so much bandwidth to deal with the world and that when you're poor, everything's harder, you're more anxious, you have a higher sort of cognitive load. And so your bandwidth to get ahead, your bandwidth to deal with the world is constricted because of your poverty. There's a tax on it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. That bandwidth tax is part of what gets people stuck. Income helps fix that bandwidth tax. Another thing is when you have money, you have choices. Choices make people happy. The sense that they have choices in their life makes people happy. You have better prospects. Prospects make people happy, as we'll talk about in a minute. And finally, obviously, income helps you meet other basic needs. You can take care of a lot of the other stuff that would otherwise be making you anxious if you have money. So we're constantly trying to maximize our portfolio in terms of successful livelihood interventions. It's so important. And Impact, then, you're, you're setting out to meet people's basic needs. You have to have impact, real impact, or you didn't do anything. It has to last, or you can leave people worse off than when you started, because loss is devastating. It reverberates in people's lives a lot longer than an equivalent success does, an equivalent gain. In fact, we talk about with gain, we talk about the hedonic treadmill. Our brains are, are wired to say, oh, that was great. Where's the next great thing? You get a raise, two months later, you wish you had another raise. Loss doesn't work that way. All those countries that are stuck, most of those post-Soviet countries, they're middle-income countries. Their basic needs are met, but they aren't as well off as, they don't perceive themselves as, as well off as they used to be, and so they're unhappy. So if we can't maintain the gains that we create, we generate more unhappiness than we started with. And that's a really big deal. And that's a super important lesson for development at large. Don't even start unless you can finish and maintain. Just don't bother. You're, you're doing something wrong. You're doing a bad thing. So thinking about lasting impact, I can't help myself. We have to talk about lasting impact a little bit. So 
the way that we've found that we can try to make sure of this is to think about the mission, what we're setting out to do, which of the basic needs are we trying to meet, what does that tell us about the exact impact that we're trying to have, what does that tell us about what people need to do differently to create that impact, because impact comes from people doing something differently. If nobody does anything different, they don't get any impact. And then, what are the conditions and the incentives that made that behavior both possible and made it happen? Can and will it happen? And looking at those is when you can look at them critically and say, can we maintain the conditions that made that behavior possible? And are the incentives there so that it will last? If we're paying people to do something, can we pay them forever? If we're creating the conditions so that farmers, say, can take things to market, can we make sure that that market is always there? Can we look systematically at the conditions and the incentives that drove the behaviors that created impact that fulfills our mission? And if we can't, we shouldn't do it. And of course, I have to say then, the only way you're going to know that is if you measure, and the only way you're going to get better at it is if you iterate. And again, I can't help myself, we've got to talk about measurement for a second. Measuring is so important to happiness because we don't know if we're having the impact that can make people happy unless we measure for it. And measurement doesn't have to be that hard, but it has to be rigorous. You need to know what you're setting out to do. You need to figure out what the right things is to measure, what that impact is supposed to be, at least the most, the just one thing, the most important thing to measure. You have to get good quality numbers and you have to make sure it was you because your impact in the world is the difference between what happened with you and what would have happened without you. And we have to measure. Our responsibility is to measure. We can't know if we've made the impact that can create happiness unless we measure for it. So the next big thing after meeting basic needs and relieving anxiety is prospects. It turns out that it's a real universal, that when people think there's a better future ahead for them and their kids, they are consistently happier. And it has to do with perception more than a reality. People have to believe their life's going to be better. It's created by momentum. So the countries with little momentum where they're stuck are often the ones that are unhappiness. They don't have, they don't see themselves as having prospects. And the consistency of progress is more important than the slope of the curve, the steepness of the curve. And I'll show you that, I'll show you what I mean by that curve in a second. So slow, steady progress is more important to happiness than rapid progress that can't be maintained. When people feel like they're investing in their future, it makes them happy. Just like it does when you plan a long time for a trip. You spend your money ahead of time, you plan for a trip. Investing in the future makes people feel optimistic about it. It makes them feel, um, anticipate that their lives are going to be better. And finally, Products and services that are aspirational make people feel like they're participating in a future that's going to be better. So here's a graph that I think um, captures this. So here is slow, steady progress. And at the end of the arrow, you're at a given level of happiness with that. Rapid progress here and then stagnation. Even though the impact is higher at the end of that, the happiness tends to be less because they lost their momentum and they don't perceive as life is getting better. They're stuck. Even though they're maybe, they may be richer at this point, it happened fast and then it stagnated. Here, they're still better off than they were at the beginning. They're more unhappy. And you see this again and again. Whenever progress is lost, people end up less happy than they started even though they're materially better off. The curve of your impact is super important. So a few things that, that in, from our portfolio and others that um, really seem to matter. So Bridge International Academies, we, we invested in them many years ago. 
$45 a year private education in the, originally in the slums of Nairobi, now all over Kenya in the largest uh, chain of private schools in Africa. Parents get to send their kids to a modern looking school and get a very, very, very good education for very little money. So they're investing in their kids in a very affordable way and in a way that feels like they're participating in modern progress. I think that generates real ha family happiness. <coughs> Kamaza is a group in Kenya working in the one of the poorest areas with terrible soils. It's like trying to farm a sandbox where they are. And they're helping people grow trees as a cash crop. There's some species of trees that really work well in this environment. And planting trees, it, what you get when you do that is you get a big chunk of money in about eight years, a substantial chunk, more than your annual income, well more than your annual income. So you're planting trees with the idea of a big windfall eight years from now. It's a major <coughs> investment in the future. And I'm convinced that the level of happiness in this whole area, simply from the progress of that, is rising, and one of the things we want to watch in this area is how many people are staying there and how many, in the little towns, how many businesses are starting. Does this, can we see signs of optimism as a material result of a specific investment in the future? And then there's off-grid electric in Tanzania. And these guys install a power plant in your house. In other words, a solar panel, good batteries, good area lighting, switch on the wall. More, better than you could ever afford. And there's a meter, and you buy the power to run your system. So they own the system. You get the power. You get to flip a switch like modern people do. You don't have to do some janky thing with the the fixture itself. It's not a little light sitting on the table. It's flip a switch, flood your house with light. It's, a, it's something we love at Malaga, which is giving the best to poor people and not just the crappy thing that they could afford. It's aspirational, though. And aspirational stuff is automatically helping you think toward the future. It's making you, giving you a sense you're participating in the future. We like aspirational stuff. And then, of course, there's Sanergy, putting modern, clean toilets into slums in Kenya, in Nairobi. So an entrepreneur owns this. They maintain it. They have a very, uh, the Sanergy team has a very uh, hygienic way of emptying them out. They end up processing the effluent into now fertilizer, mostly. These are completely change what is an utterly unpleasant experience in the slums. These are the future. These are a better quality experience that communicates uh, a better life and a more modern life. And I went into these, um, just a couple weeks ago, I went into these <coughs> sort of uh, corrugated tin and wooden pole apartment buildings, like 25 units in the middle of the slum. And the landlord had put two of these units in, he'd taken one of the apartment units and put two of these toilets in there. And they didn't smell at all, they were super clean. And he said that people loved them. He said it's completely uh, changed his turnover rates because people want to stay and live in his apartment building. And he was stoked because turnover is a, is a real drag for any landlord. It, he said it made his whole apartment complex seem more desirable. Again, great high quality services for poor people that are aspirational and feel modern. We care deeply about status. It's especially bad behavior. Whenever you see bad, especially male behavior, you can assume status is at play. And that, we are very concerned that we keep up with our, 
peer group. And it's really about our peer group more than it is national. In other words, poor people can watch TV and see absurdly rich people on TV, and they seem not to be as affected by it as you might think. What they care about is who's next to them. And there's a lot of data showing that people who live in slums are generally happier than people who are upper middle class but live in upper class neighborhoods. And there's this really interesting study showing that again and again, people would prefer to have a $90,000 salary when others are getting $70,000 than a $100,000 salary when others are getting 125. And I'm gonna show you how deeply embedded this is in us, down in our brain stems. <laughs> With uh, an experiment, this guy Franz de Waal is a primatologist, and he was interested in looking at fairness. And do animals other than humans care about fairness, and could you see it? So with these capuchin monkeys, he set up this experiment where the monkeys have rocks in their cages. They're supposed to hand a rock to the experimenter and get rewarded. Now, capuchin monkeys like cucumbers. They like grapes a lot more. So the two choices to give them in reward for the rock are cucumber or grape. So watch what happens. We're getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so, uh, they like grapes more. They do like cucumbers. I'll throw my cucumber away just to show you how pissed off I am about not getting a grape. In fact, I watched that six times last night. We're going to watch it again because I just love <laughs> this. I'm getting grape and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> she tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so a perception of unfairness can derail your work faster than anything else I can think of. <laughs> and that's one reason why there are certain times in which giveaways make sense. I think, I think the case has been made for mosquito nets, although then they end up being fishing nets, apparently. But giveaways are often just unfair. Like, what do, why does one group get something for free that another group doesn't? And bringing people up together is just hugely important to, to not generate, really not generate unhappiness. And so we think about organizations that reach down to the bottom and bring the bottom up first. And you know, Water for People, this is, a, this is a work in progress trying to get everyone, but I just love this slogan. 
everyone forever. I think it should be uh, our slogan for every organization that we start and every organization that we fund. It should be everyone forever. And that's gotten us thinking a lot about what we're calling the impact jackpot. Who needs the intervention the most? Who needs the help the most and is going to benefit the most from it? If you look at the water sector, there's some, there are some great private sector solutions out there. We've not been that crazy about them because they don't get everybody. You ask almost every single one, they have a tremendous impact. A lot of people get clean water who didn't otherwise, but I have yet to see one where you said, well, where are the poorest getting their water? They're not buying it. I, I ran across a, a J-PAL study years ago where incidentally they, they, they mentioned how puzzled they were that poor people would pay for water quantity when they couldn't otherwise get water, but they wouldn't pay for quality. They didn't see themselves as being able to afford to pay that extra for clean water. So the thing about the impact jackpot, though, is if you reach down and bring those at the bottom up, you get everybody else. You make the poorest kids healthier, everybody else gets healthier. You get clean water to the poorest people, you get clean water to everybody. You get good education to the poor, you can get education to everybody. If you shoot for the lower middle class hoping you'll go down, what we've found is you rarely do it. So go for the impact jackpot. It's where your money goes the furthest. And I've often found that when you go to the most desperate places, it's where a relatively small investment can yield the biggest results in terms of impact. So this is, some, this is something that I've thinking, been thinking about a lot that I think is, is going to shape our work more and more, is thinking about for any sector we get involved in, where is the jackpot and how can we invest our money and score big? Inyanyeri is a fuel and stove company in Rwanda that I think really embodies the last two things I've been talking about. So to give a little background, the stove clean cooking industry has a bit of a dilemma. It turns out that if you want to get a health benefit, the emerging data are showing that you need to remove the vast majority of pollutants. You need to make the air like 90% cleaner. Anything less and you don't get much health bang for the buck. And so the, the problem in the stove industry becomes the, the cheap stoves aren't good enough and the good stoves are way too expensive. So the good stoves are these what are called gasifying stoves. They're forced draft stoves with a little fan in them. And they burn really clean and they're about 80 bucks. And no poor person is ever, ever, ever going to buy one. So how do you get them to people? It's the only way to get the health benefit. So Eric Reynolds is this entrepreneur. He started uh, Marmot, the clothing company. And now he's in Rwanda trying to get clean cookstoves to people. And what they do is they essentially give them away. They, they uh, charge a, a, a rental fee, a lease fee of $7 a year. But that lease comes with a contract to buy their pellets. And their pellets cost a little bit less than charcoal. And so you have this very aspirational product that's now accessible to a lot of people. This is a totally different experience. You sit in a room with that thing going right here, and you're sitting around talking, and you're totally comfortable. And there's no visible smoke in the room. It's a totally different experience. What's even better about it is if you can't don't have the cash for pellets. If you can't afford the pellets, you can bring in biomass. You can collect biomass and then trade it for a dry weight of five to one for pellets. No one is, no one is excluded. They're reaching all the way down to the impact jackpot with an aspirational product. That's as good as it gets. One Acre Fund and organizations like Nuru working with the poorest farmers are, work, are reaching way down into the impact jackpot. The average farm size in Africa right now is 0.6 hectares. 
If you want to do agriculture and help people in Africa, you're working with the one acre farmer. And both the organizations I mentioned are trying to figure out how to get deeper and deeper into that population because it turns out that everybody's a farmer in these settings. Not everybody wants to be or is that good at being a farmer. So there's this balance between who can actually make use of our intervention and who needs it. And it turns out that not everybody who needs it can make good use of it, trying to drive that as far down to those who can make use of it is their way of trying to reach the impact jackpot. But the impact you're trying to have is money. And money creates all the good things that we talked about. So it's important that they keep trying. This is one of the toughest things, has been trying to get poor people. Poor farmers are the most conservative people on earth. They can't afford to take any risks. And you have to be really careful with what you do for them because you leave these guys worse off and they're hanging on by their fingernails. So can you create an intervention that's so high impact that you can confidently sell it to them? And how do you sell it to them? It's really hard. And so selling your intervention to them turns out to be the only way to the impact jackpot. Okay, this is, a, this is a technical term. So we got, we got our meet basic needs, prospects, keeping up with the Joneses. Zero sumness is sort of this game from, from game theory for dummies. And it's the idea that there are zero sum interactions where I win, you lose. And there are non zero sum interactions where we both get something out of it. Non-zero sum interactions are that reciprocal altruism that, that, that really formed most of our social circuitry back in the days when we were running around on the savannah. There's a brilliant book called uh, Non-Zero, written by a guy named Robert Wright, and he talks about how this is, so f this is fundamentally embedded in us, and you can see, looking at, at human history through a lens of non-zero sumness, is civilization is the process of building more and more non-zero sumness into our institutions and our political systems and our commercial systems. Tr and trade is the fundamental non-zero sum interaction. I give you what you want, money, you give me that thing, that iPad that I really wanted. And so the more we can build that in, the more comfortable and happy people are and the more likely we're going to make progress. So that is about creating strong relationships and bonds. It goes back to that family bonds thing that seems to make Latin America so happy. It's about creating more trust and trust is really the lubricant of development. And generosity, because it turns out that in those happiness surveys, one thing they broke out, like corruption, that plays a big influence on happiness, is how people perceive generosity around them makes people quite happy. So an organization that, to my mind, really embodies a lot of this is Root Capital. So I never really understood what Root Capital does until I went to see them in Uganda. And what they do is they finance producers, small companies typically, that buy from local farmers, turning them into value-added products in some way or another. So the thing that we saw in a trip to Uganda that crystallized it for me is up in the north of Uganda after the whole Lord's Resistance Army thing had gone on forever and just devastated the area, there's a big cotton farming area. And the cotton ginnery that made it all possible and had fallen into disrepair, where they, so no cotton could be processed in this whole area. And a lot of the farmers had left. And so Root Capital went in and financed the rebuilding of this cotton ginnery and the upgrading of it, and helped with technical training to run it better. And suddenly this whole industry comes back and people come back into the area and they start farming successfully again. So you get all these people having trade relationships that, that they'd lost. And then they have started having more and more relationships with each other because it turns out when you're trying to 
these farmers aren't competing with each other. The more cotton farmers, the better for the prosperity of the whole area. So you get more and more relationships bound together by this emerging industry that root capital made happen again. And the level of non-zero sumness just starts to rise in the whole area. And finally, agency makes people happy. And I don't say empowerment, because I don't know what empowerment word means. And there's a, a banned word list in our, in our office. And empowerment, sustainability, impactful. Those are all, those are banned because we don't, either don't like the way they sound or don't like, don't know what they mean. But anyway, agency is the ability to take action successfully on your own behalf. That makes people really happy. And what they need to do it is they need the skills to take successful action and they need the conditions that let those actions blossom into impact in their lives. So again, a couple organizations that, that we love that embody this. A new one that's one of our fellows is WAVE in Nigeria. Masan Rawani is the entrepreneur. And what they are doing, this is from one of their promotional videos. They take out of work youths with no real job skills, no real futures, and they train them with the soft skills that make them employable initially in the hospitality industry. The service industry is the thing that's really taking off in countries like Nigeria. It is the job of the future. And what you need to get that job of the future are the soft skills that nobody trains you for anywhere. And so when they give people these soft skills, it's like giving them a tool they can take anywhere. It's like giving them a trade that's just universally makes you hireable, makes you employable. So suddenly you go from no future to a very well-defined future in the hospitality industry, but we think that beyond that, these people are gonna be employable in a burgeoning service industry all over the world. And <clears throat> another, another organization that I think creates agency in a very uh, broad and profound way is Proximity Designs in Burma. In many ways, they, so what they, what they do is they create products and services for the rural poor to help them make money. And they come up with them and they, when needed, manufacture them, and they market and distribute them. So they started out with the lowly treadle pump. And because they treat the poor as customers, they created a whole line of them. So you're a given customer, you now have some choice as to what you do. These things are super high impact for people who've been bucket irrigating. They can triple your income. Diesel pumps started to come in the demand for these drops a little bit. They're still selling. They start looking around for, well, what else does the farmer need to realize their potential? Well, they need certain kinds of crop advice around pests and around what seeds to use. So they create farm advisory services. They need money. They need credit. They've been, they've been the, the typical Burmese farmer has been borrowing money at obscene rates for generations. They're all in debt up to their necks creating farm loans at a reasonable price just took off. So what they're looking for is what gives the hardworking farmer agency? What makes them able to succeed at farming? But then as they grew in their size and influence and reputation, they were able to create relationships with the government, with the generals, because they were seen as what their role is positive and non-threatening to everybody. It's a huge win for everybody. And then they're st able to start talking about things like currency exchange policy that's hurting their farmers to create the conditions where the skills and equipment and loans at that bottom-up level can now flourish because of top-down change. That's creating agency. So. That's where I want to leave it with happiness. So remember, anxiety is the enemy. Loss is devastating. People need to dream. 
status never sleeps. <laughs> it's always lurking in the background. And more specifically, when you design, I think we have a, a, a clicker failure here. We're almost done. So meet their basic needs, create prospects, raise everybody, go big on zero-sum relationships, and make them able. And then remember, <laughs> that's, that's all I got. So we got, we got some time to, to get your, your thoughts on how do you design for more happiness, and in fact, anything you want to weigh in on, because um, there's probably a huge amount of expertise in this room that we haven't even begun to tap. And I'm curious what, what, what you're all thinking about happiness and how we maximize it. Go ahead. So um, in India, people are openly that. In in Hello. Yeah, my name is Jack Sim from the World Toilet Organization. So in India, people who get toilet for free are openly defecating and using it as storerooms. So I want to reposition the toilet from dark, dirty and smelly into the happiest room in India. Because people are happier after they go to the toilet. <laughs> so it's very clear. So can you advise me what would be uh, good triggers? Well, I would tell you one time I was giving a talk and I I just noticed I was feeling uncharacteristically anxious, and more so as the talk went on. The talk was going reasonably well. I couldn't figure it out. And suddenly I realized, I really need to pee. <laughs> so, relieving anxiety. <laughs> I'm, uh, hi, I'm Janet Longmore from the Digital Opportunity Trust. I'm just curious if you've done any work or looked into the situation uh, for refugees and uh, some of the points you made, loss, loss is devastating, what happens when their status fundamentally changes and everyone is mixed together. And, and you know, we didn't mention resiliency in any of the, uh, the things that contribute to happiness. So just, it's a growing issue. And I'm wondering if you've looked into that at all. I haven't. Does anybody have anything to say about resilience? I will say one thing about refugees is you notice the Palestinians <coughs> often are high. The other, but the weird thing is that Palestine also has the highest depression prevalence rates in the world, about 30%. So at any given point in time, 30% of the people around you in Gaza fit the criteria for major depression. And then you think, oh, well, they're all depressed because of the shitty experience that Palestinians have had for so long. You go next door to Jordan, where they haven't had that experience, 25%. So there's something weird going on there, either genetically or culturally. <coughs> so the refugee experience, I don't really, I don't, I haven't really seen um, happiness surveys uh, directly around refugees, but I didn't really look for them, and it's, it's really worth it. The one thing is, I was super impressed with this, even though we are devastated by loss, we're really good at adapting to change, and we're really good at getting used to things. And so the data are people who win the lottery, basically about the same level of happiness a year later. People who are paralyzed, basically the same level of happiness about a year later. We, we adapt really, really well. But when people lose economic progress, until they gain it back, they tend to, to show profound discontent. 
who, who is not. Um, so let me just work around here. So I, I wanted to ask. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. The experience we have with mothers to mothers is the notion that mothers come in and have a baby that's more likely to be HIV negative. But with the, the, the vagaries of funding, sometimes we've had to close programs. And if we didn't ever start because we weren't guaranteed funding indefinitely, we wouldn't contribute to the immediate good of those mothers who are pregnant. So how do you live in a world where we are innovating and there's a risk of failure? And how do you live in a world where you can't always test your hypothesis without trying something that may not succeed, and how can you be good for a while and then not be sustainable without feeling that you've devastated the people to whom you're responsible? So I think we have to start with the fact that we have to make sure that we are happy. Happy. <laughs> no, no, seriously, I mean, we've taken yeah, care of 1.2 yeah, yeah. million mothers with HIV. Right. I feel really good about that. Well, uh, yeah, but, <laughs> thank but, you for that. But, we also, but we've also closed 300 program sites in the last year because our USAID funding ran out. Right. Tough. We do tell our fellows, be careful of working with anybody whose acronym includes the letter U. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will say, though, if you think about the individual who participated, their effect is lasting. Their health is lasting. Their kids' health is lasting. The people who don't get to participate in your program, they don't, they almost never know what they're missing. So there are times when the program can, I, I, this is my opinion, the program can end and it has no effect on the happiness of participants. But if you say, get everybody growing passion fruit somewhere and you couldn't be sure that the market for passion fruit would be a stable one, then you can get yourself in trouble. That's an interesting yeah, I think, I think distinction. I think it's a good distinction, thanks. It's a really good distinction. So I have the mic. Can I ask a quick question? Thank you. Um, Kevin, the oh, idea of <laughs> jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the impact jackpot, right? So I see, you know, you're, you're, you're advising looking at the worst part of the problem, the poorest, where it's the greatest. In terms of large-scale impact, this concept of uh, early stage intervention, how much of that um, can we see in, with mental health? And uh, you know, the, the early childhood years where parents actually have very high impact on the life of a child. So I'm seeing an analogy between the poorest and when you're also the most vulnerable in your life and how uh, you know, the jackpot impact of focusing in those early stage where you support parents to actually uh, you know, <coughs> be educated parents, be, be better parents. That's a nice way to put it though, the most vulnerable. You could say the poorest, the most vulnerable. Like, like with water, I think about water. Like who suffers the most from a waterborne disease? It's the least, the most poorly nourished it's the most marginally employed. You could think those are, those are two people for whom a diarrheal illness is gonna be more devastating otherwise. Who's the most vulnerable to deprivation? I would argue that it's really early, uh, kids in early development. We know more every week, it seems like, about the importance of micronutrients for virtually everything that happens to them later. So I think you can, yeah, you know, there's a lot of ways to think about the impact jackpot, all of them beginning with the, with the modifier the most. Who are the, the, the superlative? Who's the poorest? Who's the most vulnerable? Who's the most forgotten? Oh, man. Up here. Hi there. Um, this is Hazel from the VTOL Foundation. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. You were talking about perceptions of unfairness, and you also talked about giving up free handouts uh, of things may not um, may, may create that that perception. Um, what impact do you think um, is 
uh, that there is between, or what correlation is there between participation of communities in deciding who gets what and being involved in the design of a program and, and general happiness of the community. Do you think that's quite a, a major factor? That, <coughs> it's interesting, in the, in the development world it went, there's, there was a huge pendulum. It went from we know everything, they don't know anything, to we don't know anything, they know everything, which neither one of those positions really makes any sense. There's a whole world of experience and knowledge that needs to be seen through a local lens. So that sometimes you can have an intervention that the local people don't need to participate in at all. It works. If things work, they work. And when people generally feel a sense of agency, though, if they've participated in some way. So I think about it uh, through a lens of agency. Did their participating in the planning of something give a sense of agency and ownership that makes them more likely to, makes the behavior that creates impact more likely or not? Or is the behavior likely even without that part of it, especially since that part is often expensive to do? So I think it's looking at it uh, um, critically and saying, do I need to do that? And being honest about when it does and being willing to spend the money and do it right when it does. Here and then there. Uh, thank you. Vic Mohan from Blue Ventures Conservation. Um, I want to say two things. Firstly, I want to wish everybody a belated International Day of Happiness. 20th of March was the Uni United Nations International Day of Happiness, so we're three weeks late, but happy, happy Happiness Day. Well, that went right by. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've, I've been sort of dip dipping my toys, toes in the toilet of happiness and sort of quite interested in the subject, so uh, I know a little bit about it. And, and so I want to first respond to your comment about resilience. Um, and from what I understand about the literature, you know, resilience includes an ability to be able to manage difficult emotions and difficult experiences as well as being able to feel happy. So I think resilience and happiness look at different things, but they, they, they probably are related, but resilience also includes an ability to manage difficult emotions and things that aren't related to happiness. So they're looking at different things. And, and that leads me to the, my next point, Kevin, which is, ought we to be talking about well-being rather than happiness? Uh, I've been following this discussion a little bit, and uh, there are those who say that well-being is a more robust and valid marker for what it is we're really trying to measure and achieve. I just wondered if you could respond to that. All those things make sense. Like there's one, there's one that, that asks people, are you thriving, struggling, or suffering? That one's a really interesting, a really interesting survey and has a lot of surprising results. Attempts to measure well-being across a broader index of things that include health is a really interesting one. I kind of like, I like the are you satisfied one. It just seems like it's letting the person somehow integrate all that for you. But they're, they're all, they all show something really, they all show useful and surprising <coughs> stuff. Uh, my name is Shonali Khan, and I'm from an organization called Breakthrough in India. And interestingly, India was absent from your you know, list of countries on most accounts, so I was curious. Uh, there was every other country there, happy, unhappy, etc. But yeah, that's it. Uh, actually, I was a little curious, and I was thinking about what I sort of in my head started calling the happiness theory. And it sort of retrofitted into a lot of developmental experience that we've been having over the last century. I mean decades of education, providing education at scale, health at scale, at a, you know, at, at sort of a easy level, not episodic, it sort of continues and goes on. But none of this challenges the status quo. None of them is disruptive. They don't challenge um, power equations. Uh, and I somehow felt that your happiness theory was sort of lulling us into status quo. It was there were great social innovations that you sort of uh, case studied here, but they didn't help us break out of status quo. So I'd love to hear from you if in your research there were sort of examples that may have made tectonic shifts on status quo and happiness that got redefined for people, not, not from 
uh, stoves that we lit in our rooms or water pumps that we sort of irrigated our uh, farms with, but defined how, as citizens, we participated in decision making, determined the way the country's <coughs> future uh, was going to be um, led. So I'd love to hear about that a bit. It was just, I, I mean, maybe you have the answers. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah, with um, happiness theory, everything is uh, possible. I mean, I just have to say, first, I'm not a researcher on happiness. I read some books and thought about it and so on, <laughs> and inflicted it on you. But um, I don't know about disruptive change and stuff. I know about impact. And I know that impact makes people happy. And so I think a lot about impact at scale. And we do know that, and I think about choice, and I think about freedom, and I think about corruption, I think about a lot of those things. And as Mulago, we're investors. So we have to find an organization that is changing things. And when we find them, we fund them. And we fund them for as long as we're seeing the, the impact curve that we're hoping for. So I don't know the world that you're talking about all that well, but I do know that it's hard to know and find impact in that world, and we don't know how to invest without measuring impact. So while the clearly people's choice, freedom, um, their, uh, their freedom from tyranny and corruption play a big role in happiness, meeting basic needs, as far as I can tell, plays an even bigger role. And so that's where we have focused. So I don't really know much about some of the topics you're, you're bringing up, and I think they're hugely, hugely important. What about the Indian ranking? I don't know. I'll, give, I'll send you the links. You can look it up. They're, they're generally somewhere in the middle. And besides India, every state's a country. So it's kind of hard to generalize about India. So let's go quickly, just sweeping around that way. And, and, and uh, people, if you've got something else to do, go ahead and leave. It's a beautiful day out there. Tina Dason from Queen School of Business, and uh, I have more of a comment. And one thing that I didn't hear come up as much was the whole issue of community. And so to me, happiness is often rooted in social capital. So I think that some of your examples are really interesting, but when we look at scaling them up or out, it would be <coughs> actually more powerful even for us to look at that power of community. So I think that's why the movement for social enterprise and for the work that we're doing is, is really so powerful with happiness together because it's being done collectively. And so maybe some of the countries that are profiled is because they also have a lot of work going on in a collective way. I, I, I'm sure you're absolutely right. And it's, it's again, the Latin American examples people feel like um, they talk about how comparatively strong family and community ties are in those cultures. And there's a lot of research on social capital and happiness. Absolutely. I was trying to capture that, and maybe it didn't work that well, and the, the notion of non-zero sumness. That is really a, a, um, a way of thinking about building social capital. So thank you for that That's point. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I think, and it's Paul from CDP, in a global world, you know, so much of the problems are really kind of coming from the industrialized countries, and I'm wondering, to what degree we need some of this innovation in our industrialized countries really to be able to kind of mitigate what's happening in the, so to say, less industrialized world? I'm sure, well, you just, you just said something out there as like hours of discussion to what degree that is and isn't the case, but I don't really know anything about the industrialized world, so I tend not to talk about it very much. <coughs> Hi, I'm Daniela Paviak here at the Skoll Center. Um, I loved the video. It's, uh, there's a quote that you probably know, comparison is the enemy of joy, right? <laughs> um, and I, that, was, that was amazing with the monkeys. But I mean, I think the, the, the question from Mothers to Mothers, the, the idea of what's the comparison once you do something and you stop, right? I mean, well, I worked in Cambodia for, for a long time, and the World Food Program just stopped for three months in a, a lot of areas because they didn't have you know, funding. And, and so, 
is was that a problem? Would it have been a problem before? Was it a problem when people were depending on it? You know, so what does that look like? But I guess w with the, the question about um, tectonic shifts, I think it's, it, it's for me, Indian Yeri is a sh total tectonic shift in what we're looking at, not just because, yeah, great, we're providing, actually, uh, you know, they're providing um, an energy source that is clean, but because the poorest people have a way of participating in that without money and having that that ability, you know. So, w I guess sometimes the level of value has less to do with the service and more to do with how people perceive their their happiness at the end. So, how are you teaching your investees or working with your investees to actually start measuring the happiness, not the impact that they thought they were giving? Like when I worked with Offgrid, it wasn't light. It was, hey, I can feed my my chickens all night now and they get really fat. You know, how are you, that's, that's a level of happiness. How are you helping them measure happiness outside of just their, what they thought their impact was? We're not, I don't think we are uh, systematically yet, but one of the, another thing I love about proximity is they think about things like net promoter scores. Are you delighted enough with this, with this product and its effect in your life that you would recommend it to somebody else? This notion of treating the poor as customers really has a lot to do with thinking about their happiness. We think about customers' happiness often more than we think about beneficiaries' happiness. Let's do two more and then let's clear the room. Yes. OK. Uh, my name is Isaac. I'm the school Young Leaders uh, Forum uh, Young uh, Candidates. Uh, I'm a Zimbabwean living in diaspora, but uh, it's quite interesting, although my opinion is based on the media art course, that Zimbabwe ranks at the bottom of. Could you kindly elaborate further on that? What are the possible causes of that from your understanding? Well, I, I can guess. I, I will tell you, there's an, if you look at the 2013 data, they're rising up in the ranks. and when. I was recently in Zimbabwe. There is a sense of optimism that things are getting better there. Clearly, Zimbabwe went from being the breadbasket of Africa to being a country that can't feed itself. And, and I think therein lies almost everything. With an oppressive government that, that gave you, that constricted your sense of possibility and opportunity, and the loss of all momentum and progress, they go straight to the bottom. Now, you're seeing some moderate reforms, and even a moderate reform in a place like Zimbabwe has an outsized effect on happiness. I think that last one up there, make it good. Hi, Christine Pearson from Life and Technologies. I spent a lot of time talking to people who are uh, poor and vulnerable and asking a lot of questions. So if I say something like, um, or, if, or if they say something bad has happened to them, like uh, uh, there was too much rain, or the rains didn't come, or a baby died, or in fact, a baby was born healthy, whatever happens, oftentimes the response is, if you say, why do you think that is? The answer is, it's God's will. And one thing you didn't mention is the role of faith and belief in all of this. And if you've come across this uh, at all in the research that you've done. It's huge. And it varies. And that's about all I know. It's a really big deal. And um, we don't get involved in it, so I don't really know anything. I don't really know very much about it. But um, it's very clear, even, even my cruise through the literature that wasn't really looking for that, it jumps out at you. It really does matter in people's lives. Um, I just finished watching a great documentary on happiness. And they did do a correlation between sort of religiosity and happiness. And the more fundamental the religion, uh, the less happy. There's sort of a bell curve that if you've got a little bit, it's a good thing. And if you have too much, it's a bad thing. So um, it, w it seemed to be a, a reasonable study. On that note, I think we need to clear the room. Thank you so much, you guys.